Hi, I'm Jeff Ranke, Editorial Director of Manufacturing.net and Manufacturing Business Technology. Welcome to Security Breach. One of the mantras that I've clung to from my childhood is drawn from one of my favorite toys, G.I. Joe. Duke, Snake Eyes, and the rest of the Joes always reinforced that knowing is half the battle. Well, if that's truly the case, then the industrial sector still has a ways to go in fully combating the impact of cyber attacks and shoring up their cybersecurity strategies. Insurance provider Travelers recently unveiled their most recent risk index survey, with cybersecurity ranking as the single biggest business concern. Additional findings included that one out of four surveyed have been victims of cyber attacks, with half of those attacks occurring within the last year. 71% said they were repeat victims. Furthermore, 57% think an attack is inevitable, with their biggest fears in order being a security breach, system glitch, or ransomware attack. And finally, 80% of business leaders reported difficulty in keeping up with the evolving cyber landscape. So if knowing is indeed half the battle, most are defending from a compromised and disadvantaged position. Joining us to discuss these ongoing concerns is Kirsten Simonson, Technology Lead at Travelers. So, Kirsten, thanks again so much for joining us today on Security Breach. You know, in looking at the latest report that Travelers put out, it was kind of interesting to see a large number of people indicating that they just don't know how to keep up with the cybersecurity landscape. Whether it's real or perceived, what do you think are some of the issues there in terms of people just not understanding what's going on and how can we help them out a little bit more? Yeah, Jeff, um, thank you uh, for inviting me to speak on this a little bit. So you're referring to data from our 2022 Travelers Risk Index. And, you know, it's an interesting question when you think about why companies aren't, they may be recognizing they have exposure, but they haven't quite taken the extra steps. And I think there are several reasons contributing to this, and these are going to vary from organization to organization. You know, one of the reasons they may not be acting is because they think it won't happen to them. They're not a target. They're not big. They're not something, they don't hold something that someone else would want. But we also need to consider what is going on inside the organization. You know, for example, thinking about manufacturing organizations, quite often there can be competing priorities at work, right? So resources are maybe being deployed to meeting deadlines and customer demands. And when you think about over the last couple of years during COVID, you know, that really put a lot of stress on every aspect of the supply chain. So really, where were they, you know, focusing their priorities? But sometimes another challenging area might be the operational technology assets. So again, thinking about manufacturing, These are years or decades old systems, and they might not receive automatic updates like newer technologies. And trying to manage all of these endpoints can be very, very challenging and and costly. And then I go back to just this perception that I still hear, which surprises me a little bit, is this focus on data breaches, personally identifiable information. And I don't hold that. I don't have that. I don't have to worry about it. And I think we all have to remember that, yes, that still happens, right? So there can still be just a good old fashioned data breach, but it's not always only about stealing personally identifiable information. It can actually shut your systems down. And so again, when you think about that manufacturing company, if you're unable to operate at all or partially for a week, two weeks or longer, what's going to be the impact? Um, And so I think some of it's, you know, just maybe thinking more deeply about or a deeper risk assessment maybe is necessary for some of these firms. No, it makes a lot of sense. And I'm going to circle back to some of that, that those attitudes that are just so prevalent, especially in the industrial sector, but it can't happen to me. But I want to dig into a couple of other areas as well. You know, when we when we talk about the industrial sector and from where you sit and working with folks, are you seeing any specific tactics that people are taking uh, in terms of accomplishing their mission and breaching these, these industrial players? And do you have any advice then also on how to prepare a response to some of these different types of attacks? Well, sadly, I really haven't seen any major differences in tactics used when they're targeting industrial or manufacturers 
like you, I think you're alluding to the types of targets can shift and, you know, what is the threat actor or the criminal hoping to gain from that, right? Yeah. But they're still going to continue to use methods that are tried and true. They're still going to engage in deploying malware, using phishing, and they are going to monitor for and attack known vulnerabilities. So they're going to look for areas that they can compromise within that, that sector. sector. So, you know, the best way to prepare and prevent for a potential attack. I mean, there are many, many things the industrial industrial sector manufacturers can do, and I won't go through all of them. So I'm going to assume they at least have a framework in place and they've started the work and they've done an assessment and, and, and started that area. But one area to start really focusing on if they haven't is what are the critical systems? And then how do you protect those critical systems from an intrusion? And thinking about this a little bit further, making sure they have really good segmentation of these systems. So keeping the corporate system separate from the production floor, for example. So if you're separating your critical systems from non-critical ones, uh, that's going to be very, very helpful in the event that there is an infiltration. So put yourself in that employee's chair with the employee email. If your email account is compromised, can that compromise lead down into the production floor. And if you've stopped that and walled that off, uh, you've probably saved yourself a lot of headache. And there are some very simple tools that can be used. And you'll hear me talk about this probably more than once today about, and that is multi-factor authentication. And MFA, I cannot stress this enough, really needs to be deployed at every level of internal and external access. I attended a couple of conferences in the last few weeks that are focused on cybersecurity and insurance. And in each one, the experts continue to stress that MFA is a key factor in preventing successful intrusions. You know, if, if my credentials, my username and my password is compromised, the unauthorized user is not going to access, be able to access the targeted devices without that random authentication factor that MFA provides. Um, you know, it's been shown and Microsoft has talked about how 99% of ransomware can be stopped by MFA. And one, uh, Arite has put out studies that when they're looking out at actual ransomware attacks over the past couple of years, over 90% of those happened because MFA was not in place. So it is one of the tools can be very, very effective. Another area to think about is, okay, so you put in the MFA, but you want to make sure that you can monitor all of your endpoints, right? So looking at some point, type of endpoint detection and response solution or XDR or something similar. So you want something that's going to detect something that's coming into the networks, track it, potentially stop it. It's important to consider whether these there are newer tools, because let's say you have EDR already in place, there's been a lot of updates over the past couple of years. So making sure you're thinking through that solution you have, does it give you the right analytics? Does it give you the full detection, investigation, response, flexibility, and scalability that you need? Two areas that sometimes get lost in the discussion, training and vendor management. So training to make sure everyone is aware of the threats and make sure your vendors and suppliers are not your weakest link in your security chain. Yeah, I think the, the point about vendors and suppliers is really interesting. We're hearing, you know, when we go all the way back to like Stuxnet and where that came from a USB device and things like that, I think that bleeds into a little bit of a strategy that some manufacturers, probably not enough, but some are taking with like a zero trust type of, uh, of approach. Maybe you could talk about two things here, Kirsten, maybe your thoughts on the zero trust strategy. And then are there things from a training perspective that manufacturers can do to help their employees out so that cybersecurity doesn't just become sort of another piece of white noise in the background, so to speak? I'm going to start with the training component, if you don't mind. Sure. Um, it is something that to me is near and dear to my heart. I think uh, you know, the human factor plays a, a big role here. And we constantly need reminders or updates on the role that we play in protecting our organization. 
And, you know, when you think about it over the years, the sophistication of phishing emails and different types of business email compromise, they've become almost un detectable from the human eye you know i get some of these and i'm i will sit there and spend a lot of time looking at these inside out and upside down it's like is this real or is this something you know i should maybe not look at and, and send to our security <laughs> folks yeah. um but you know if you're not continually testing your folks and training them on the impact you know they might get that email that says you know hey wedding photos and, and open it up and and away the criminal goes um, but also thinking about the importance of passwords and how you're setting passwords and why you want them to set passwords certain w ways. And, you know, back to MFA, assuming you've deployed it, now you have to get your users to understand why it's so critically important and why, you know, there can be resistance to it. It's an extra few steps or one step. Um, but why that is helping protect your organization, what it means to them and, as well. Zero day is an interesting concept, and it's one that I don't know that I'm very well versed or prepared to talk on. And part of that is because when I, when I speak to people, when I say zero day, one organization is going to have one philosophy on it or one impression of what it means, and another one's going to think something differently. Um, but conceptually, you know, trust no one right and making sure and, and kind of mfa comes into play right yeah. it, making sure that it's something unknown that the criminals can't guess at they can't find this information anywhere else so zero trust is definitely something that i encourage organizations to understand and bring forward as part of their holistic approach to risk management Absolutely. So, you know, one of the parts when we sort of try to segue a little bit during the course of the episode, we talk a lot about, a lot about negative stuff. Hopefully we can talk about some positive things here too. Uh, Kirsten, when we look at the, some of the things that Travelers is doing to help in the cybersecurity realm, maybe you can walk us through some of the things that you do and to help folks out. I really appreciate that you asked that question. You know, a lot of times folks think of insurance as not necessarily a uh, a partner in this process and this risk management process. So we work very hard to provide our customers with information and education upfront so that whether that's through our internal risk control team, uh, the Travelers Institute, our one on one rate relationships we have uh, with our agents, brokers and some of our insureds. Um, we have a lot of material on our travelers.com website around best practices. As a policyholder, they have access to even more information. So for us, training and education and engagement is critically important. Um, then on the, you know, the backside, they have bought an insurance policy, right? And they expect something from that. So when the bad day happens, we want to make sure that we are engaging with them fully to help them walk through the process, getting the right people in place to help them with what is arguably a very stressful time um, and, and hopefully reaching a good outcome quickly for them because these events are something where we, we've seen it all, right? A business interruption can bring you down for a couple of days or it might actually put you out of business. And so how do we make sure that they come out on the other side uh, viable and resilient? Absolutely. That's where we all want to be. You know, I want to circle back a little bit, Kirsten, to something you brought up earlier about folks thinking this can't happen to me. And I think in the industrial sector that happens because when we look at some facts from the National Association of Manufacturers, they're saying 87% of uh, manufacturing firms have fewer than 50 people. I think a lot of folks just think I'm too small. I'm not important enough. I'm not on their radar. What can? What's your perspective there in terms of, of having that attitude and how dangerous that can be? And then also you mentioned about a lot of strategies and in getting employees involved. Those are great, but have you seen anything that really helped employees grab onto and take stuff like double factor authentication really seriously? Great question. You know, I think the first thing I, I would talk about is the reminder that 
cyber criminals quite often are very opportunistic, right? So if they see a significant opportunity in small businesses who haven't properly managed their exposures. Yeah. They need to remember there are people out there who are scanning for vulnerabilities that they can exploit. So looking beyond that, you know, there's just still the run of the mill risk exposures with all of the technology. We all carry our smartphones, laptops, desktops. So even myself as an employee, if I lost my corporate device or my personal device that's connected into the corporate network, what impact does that have on the company? And I don't know that everyone necessarily thinks about that. And so when you're explaining it to them, this is what can happen. Uh, and just being very honest about it, right? Um, myself as an employee, you know, I think what really was very, very helpful was the training that really did identify if this happened, here's what could happen to us as an organization. And so just laying that out and being very open and honest and providing them with as much resource as they need to help understand that. No, it makes a lot of sense. That's a, it's a lot of great information there. Looking ahead, Kirsten, you know, maybe the next 12, 18 months a little bit, what are some of the biggest trends that you're seeing, either from potentially new threats or even things that organizations are starting to do more of internally in responding to uh, to these additional threats? Yeah. One of the, the trends, and I don't know if this gets right to the point of your question, but I, I expect that we're going to see a lot more regulation uh, in the next 12 to 18 months and globally, not just yeah. here in the U.S. Um, you know, in March, we had the Cyber Incident Reporting for Critical Infrastructure Act signed into law, and there's still work to be done to actually uh, enforce that. But I, you know, we've seen a lot of action coming out of the White House around cybersecurity, and I think we're going to see a lot more of that. Uh, we're actually starting to see security standards for certain industry around, you know, uh, uh, the actual software material, software bill of materials. I'm going to get that one wrong. Um, <laughs> I always get it wrong. But really, when you're developing something, is it secure? How is it secure? And, and being able to put a label on it, right? I don't know that I... Cyber criminals don't usually change tactics unless they have to. But I do anticipate we're going to see some new approaches, you know, as businesses and, and manufacturing and industrial all sectors get more savvy about this, are doing better jobs about deploying MFA and EDR and other tools. Uh, I think they may have to find different ways of coming at it. We've seen a little bit of a lull in ransomware over the past couple months. Uh, we're starting to see that tick back up again. Yeah. Um, so that's not going away. I don't want folks to somehow feel things may be a little quiet right now, but that's not going to last forever. Um, so a lot more of the same, but I think my biggest area is the, the regulation that might be coming down and how that's going to impact what they need to do or how they might have to react. No, I'd agree. I think the, the legislation is uh, going to be a very interesting development there, especially because it's going to force a lot of what they call critical companies to be more transparent when these hacks do occur. And, and sharing that information hopefully helps everybody else out too. You know, you bring up a great point. Information sharing is, is really, really important. And there are so many organizations, starting with uh, CISA and, you know, the government organization, you know, there's so many great resources out there and that I think is really helpful to any business, any entity when they're engaging with those organizations, whether it's through NAM or CISA or whoever it is, uh, you, you're going to be able to stay on top of, of what's happening out there. You don't have to do it all yourself for sure. Uh, there's really a lot, a wealth of information out there. 
Yeah. You know, one thing too, you said about ransomware sort of winding down a little bit. I can remember talking to an expert on these ransomware groups and he was talking about how they have quotas and budgets that they need to hit just like everybody else. So in the last part of the year, they can start to ramp up again if some of these guys are falling behind and not hitting their quotas, so to speak. So keep the defenses up here towards the end of the year when it comes to those types of attacks as well. Yeah, you cannot rest. Thanks, Kirsten. For more information on the work Travelers does, you can go to travelers.com backslash cyber. Thanks for joining us today. To catch up on past episodes, you can go to manufacturing.net, ien.com, or mbtmag.com. You can also check Security Breach out wherever you get your podcasts, including Apple, Amazon, and Overcast. Finally, if you've got a cybersecurity story to share or a topic you'd like to see us cover, feel free to contact me at jeff at ien.com. For Kirsten Simonson, I'm Jeff Ranke, and this is Security Breach.